Belarus across the globe in nine languages, 24/7 online, FM and satellites. Radio Belarus International, bringing Belarus closer. Sometimes the reality that seems to be so clear from a distance changes its essence at a closer look. Details and motives are becoming more tangible and full immersion into one country's specifics give analysts and policymakers far more broader perspective. This is of significant importance in this turbulent time, especially when it comes to discovering the mysterious Russian soil. We get in touch with political analyst from Brussels, Gilbert Doctor, who spent several weeks in St. Petersburg to share his impressions of the visit. Mr. Doctor, it's very important for uh, analysts, uh, experts, uh, to get inside information, information on the ground about the countries they focus on. And you have just returned from Russia. Uh, have you seen any drastic changes in people behavior and political atmosphere since the beginning of their conflict in Ukraine as the country appeared to be under international pressure and severe sanctions? Yes, well, I, I have seen changes. Uh, nothing that I would describe as radical, but um, There, there is a change in, pop, in popular mood. There is a, um, a certain surge of patriotic enthusiasm in the country. Um, and there's also at the same time, a reluctance to say very much uh, to people whom you are not certain uh, will be sympathetic to your views because there is a difference of opinion within the country. Uh, and if maybe 80% of Russians, according to polls, approve of the special military operation, that still leaves you a 10 or 20% who do not. And you don't want to get into acrimonious um, discussions, particularly if the people you're approaching are friends or relatives. It can be very costly to relations. At the same time, there are always in a society certain people who, who talk freely and, uh, and who give you people like myself, an observer from outside, a chance to sense what, what the thinking is. And these people are taxi drivers. They're, they are free talkers everywhere in the world or your barber, your hairdresser. Uh, they would be very bored if they didn't have a chance to talk about topical issues with their clients. So it's from these people, I also have a sense of um, the feelings. Now, sometimes these feelings are uh, benefiting from insider information. In Russia, particularly, You never know who your taxi driver will be. When you consider that, uh, that Vladimir Vladimirovich himself, about a month ago, acknowledged that in, in, in 1991, he had to drive a taxi for a while. So one of my taxi drivers uh, started a conversation with me uh, saying that, you know, the, the, the beginning of the special operation was terrible for us. We lost a lot of men and it shouldn't have happened. It was because we had a bad generalship and uh, the good people who were just generals weren't involved. It was lieutenant generals who were leading things and they weren't always very good appointees. Um, his recommendation was that they all should be shot. Well, that, that is a distinctly um, old fashioned view of how you deal with, with uh, failure or, tr or maybe even treason. Uh, but then it is, as he explained, he was a, a retired um, colonel in the, Uh, the foreign military intelligence. Now, there is no question that the, that the war got off to a bad start or the military operation got off to a bad start. It's also without, uh, without any question that the military operation is going very well now. Uh, the Russians got their act together. They have a new generalship that is um, applying some very uh, time-proven methods. And they're also operating in the geographic area that is much more favorable to their equipment and material and training than at the start of the operation. So the end game is more clearly in sight today than it was, say, two months ago when I had this discussion, or six weeks ago when I had this discussion with my taxi driver. Um, I have written in my website my observations. I've shared with the public my observations about what I saw on the ground Uh, in Petersburg, I was mostly in Petersburg, also in the suburbs and, uh, and in the countryside out as far as 80 kilometers from Petersburg. 
what I saw, uh, what I heard, the most imp important impression was that uh, stability in supply of goods, the um, notion that Russia is has uh, lost suppliers or is out of stock, is completely false. The, the uh, supermarkets, the, the uh, city markets with stalls, they all are very well supplied. Some of the staple goods, like uh, liquor, wine, and so forth, they were always uh, present in Russia in warehouses in amounts sufficient for several months. So we haven't yet seen the, those stocks being drawn down. Nonetheless, there are many pretenders, many candidates to fill the slots, which may be um, emptied by, by, for example, Spanish or Italian uh, or French wine suppliers. The Russians long ago had Argentinian, Chilean, uh, South African suppliers, and they have now an excellent supply of their own uh, wines, not just from Crimea, but also from, uh, from the um, uh, neighboring southern uh, uh, territories, uh, from Krasnodar on south to the Black Sea, the Taman Peninsula, for example. So the Russian supply of goods that are in great demand uh, is largely met by, by uh, suppliers whom, whom they will now um, raise to greater positions and by their own suppliers. Uh, by their own domestic production. Uh, produce, uh, f um, that is vegetables, fruits, are um, being filled in from some new suppliers like Iran, which I never saw supply celery before, or iceberg lettuce, but now there it is, um, by Azerbaijan, by Turkey, um, by Uzbekistan. They are providing top quality uh, produce, produce which sometimes is better than we get in, in Western Europe simply because Western Europe has its own protectionism in place to protect the Spanish or the um, Italian uh, producers at the expense of other producers within the, the uh, European Union, like Greece, which uh, Greece, you can find Greek strawberries more in Moscow than you can here in Brussels. The, the point is that uh, anyone with uh, money in his pocket can find excellent products, sometimes, as I say, better, fresher than what we have in supermarkets or even in specialized stores in Belgium and in Western Europe. Uh, it would come as a surprise, I think, to know, for, for, for the audience to know that in Petersburg, there is a, there is a food emporium um, uh, that is as good or better than Harrods in London or than similar stores in Paris, not to mention the rest of Europe, uh, which uh, the Russian stores exceed completely. So uh, the notion that sanctions would harm the food supply, would, would harm people as they live every day, is completely false. There are, of course, <clears throat> um, uh, shortages in some areas, like ladies' cosmetics, favored mass brands, which have sold out simply because ladies were, uh, ran to the shops to store up. Um, but there, what we see uh, coming into, into force is what's called parallel trading. That is, Western and, and generally global uh, consumer products coming into the Russian market from uh, middlemen. It's all legal. The products concerned are not dual use military products. They're all civilian products. Cosmetics are, are not banned in any way. Um, they, uh, nor are washing machines or, or dishwashers. The issue is that the suppliers, the manufacturers, uh, close down their their uh, shops in the country or stop, stop s s supplying directly. So middlemen step in. They can be in Iran. They can be in Turkey. They can be in in other in Kazakhstan. And for a fee, uh, for a margin, they supply both full products and spare parts to the Russian market. That is just beginning. It will it will develop into a complete new logistics scheme for Russian consumer, for consumer goods on the Russian market. And the Russian um, consumer, the average citizen will hardly notice a difference because the original manufacturer was not selling his products margin free. He also took a margin and uh, the end price is slightly different, but not one that will put off the consumer. In Russia, what I saw in, in the markets was inflation 
of maybe 10 or 15% in prices compared to where they were on my last visit in October. Uh, but then here in Belgium, we have 10% or more inflation, and we have shortages of many products, which have been hoarded by housewives in the fear that they'll no longer be able to find a flower or... Quite surprisingly, the Russian ruble is threatening against the expectation that the Russian economy would have been collapsed. Well, this is a very difficult um, uh, issue. Yes, the Russian, the Russian ruble is not only stronger than it was before the start of the military operation, but it's stronger than it's been in maybe two years, and it's strengthening every day. The dollar is now below um, uh, 60 rubles to the dollar. Just remember that in the first days of the operation, the euro was trading at over 120 rubles to the dollar. It's now trading at 61, 62, and it is going, the ruble is strengthening against that. The reasons are market driven. Uh, the reason is that Russia has yet to rearrange its imports. So there has been a large stoppage of imports of all kinds of goods, while Russia's exports have been driven higher in value by the rising fuel costs, and the rising hydrocarbon prices across the world. So Russia may be exporting 10% less petroleum than it was before February 24th, but it's exporting it at a higher price. Therefore, net revenues into Russia expressed, expressed in dollars and, and uh, euros are higher than they were before the operation and, exp and imports have been slashed to, a, to almost nothing, just a dribble. Uh, that will correct itself in the next three to six months as as I say, a new alternative logistics um, establishes itself and Russia starts once again to import consumer goods in substantial amounts. Um, but in, in, in all cases, the, we may expect that the ruble will remain fairly strong. And that is against all of the expectations of the, um, those who impose sanctions on the country. Uh, they were very severe sanctions. The Russia has survived is a testimony to the resilience of the country's economy and to the extreme competence of its financial managers in the, in the, in the government. Any, almost any other country in the world, perhaps even China, would have gone down in disaster if they faced the, um, the type of sanctions that were imposed on Russia after February 24th. You mentioned 10% inflation in some European countries. It's really high and unbelievable. Are there any protests in the country or are, is there any public anger because of this situation? Because uh, uh, the, the sanctions, they backfire the European economy. So well, people see the increased prices for, uh, for gasoline, um, for petrol, when they fill up their tank every, every few days. And that is a considerable expense. It is um, uh, almost double what it was before uh, these troubles began. Um, but it, the, the really politically sensitive issue will come only when the heating system begins, uh, the heating season begins in September, October. The, the, the national French newspaper here, uh, Le Soir, uh, noted on the front page last week that the mazout of, or heating oil prices have risen to one euro 47 mm -hmm. per liter, which is approximately double where they were a year ago. Now, the, these are now just abstractions. We can look at them and say, my goodness, but they will become politically sensitive when people actually have to go out and buy mazout. And that will begin in September, October. Um, I find that the price that I will have to pay to heat my house will be high uh, it will be much higher, but it'll be double what it was a year ago, and that will be rather painful, but it will not be uh, dramatic. Um, the, uh, the country has a lot of people, um, may, maybe 40% of the population, for whom these price increases will not be painful. They will be impossible. They simply do not have 1,500 euros a month to spend on heating oil. They're lucky if they have 1,500 euros a month in their net income after taxes. You have to remember that this country has a tax income, taxable rate, income tax rate of close to 50%, starting from something like 15,000 euros a year salary of a, of a tram driver. So 
the, uh, the, the money available for all living expenses of a large part of the population is not sufficient to pay the new prices of heating oil that will come when people have to place their orders in September. And I believe there will be a political reaction. It is not an accident that the prime minister of this country, De Croo, was one of the, was virtually the, the first and only European leader a week ago, just to say, maybe we have gone too far with the sanctions. I think he's a young and vigorous guy, and I think he can also add one and one and two and see the political threat coming out of the price of he heating oil when the season begins. What is your opinion? What is your assessment? Why is this uh, sanction policy is being spiraled? Because uh, six packages of sanctions uh, have been imposed, another one is to come. But what, what, what are the reasons for this? Well, in, within the European Union, we have a, um, um, a whole array of conformists, of people who, who take the notion of strength and unity to the extreme. The unity that we see in the European Union is a unity behind absolute economic stupidity. Um, but that, doesn't, that hasn't yet caused a wake up among the leadership. The, the European Commission headed by von der Leyen, uh, who is, um, I would call her a Gauleiter. She's, she's become very much uh, a leader, leadership figure in the in the German tradition of the wrong German tradition. Um, and she is steering the European Union into disaster. Uh, she didn't do very well at the start of the COVID um, uh, vaccination procurement. Somehow she survived that. But I cannot imagine that she and uh, several other, other leaders in Europe will survive the political storm that will come if there is not a change of direction against the, the present sanction policy. They had a wonderful time putting in sanction after sanction after sanction. They were, they were uh, ex extraordinarily happy at their unanimity and what kind, of, what kind of solidarity we have. But this is a lemming reaction. This is marching to the sea to be drowned. Uh, and I think the wake up call will come when political troubles hit. If Mr. Macron had problems with his gasoline tax, and the which which uh, um, yielded the yellow vest movement, that is a that is nothing compared to what's going to happen when the vast population. This is not just people who are wealthy enough to afford cars and have to suffer the price of gasoline. There's a large part of the population here that cannot afford a car, but they will also not be able to afford to heat their heat their apartments, and that becomes political. That makes it impossible for this uh, this hopeless unity in in a common commonly stupid stupid pro uh, program to survive. Uh, the other factor that will likely change the calculus is that the prospects for Ukraine are growing more grim, more grim by the day, to the point where it's not just some independent observers who are writing for the, the um, uh, non-mainstream press who are expressing their doubts, but um, none other than uh, Jens Stoltenberg, the director of, the, of NATO, who came out three days ago saying that perhaps Ukraine should consider making territorial concessions to arrive at a settlement with Russia. Uh, Washington didn't say that. Washington wouldn't say that because it, it is um, uh, too um, much a change in the direction of the Biden administration. But you can be sure that Washington gave these lines to Stoltenberg to say, because they recognize um, that the loss rate, the death rate uh, of the Ukrainian army in the present fighting in Donbass is unsustainable and will lead to the to, to, uh, to the collapse of the army and whatever whatever is left of it will either be prisoners of war dead or um, or or they will simply flee the field as deserters this cannot be maintained uh, three four weeks may be enough for to reach that point um, so the, the all of the policies of, of sanctions are predicated upon um, assisting Ukraine to resist and to beat Russia at a war. That is now, I think, recognized by most observers, even in the New York Times, even in, 
in Western media as being uh, impossible. The, and so uh, without wanting to admit defeat, um, they, they, they are quietly preparing the public for defeat. Territorial concessions uh, you mentioned uh, is very important and uh, essential part of the negotiation process. Do you assume that uh, uh, Ukraine could be able to relinquish its territorial claim to Crimea and uh, grant autonomy to the Donbass and the Ukrainian Republic? Well, I think it is generally accepted, uh, starting from Kissinger on down, that uh, Ukraine is going to have to um, abandon its claims to Crimea. The question is, the problematic issue, is what will happen to Novorossiya. And that is problematic both on the Ukrainian side and on the Russian side. Although we've heard many times in the last several weeks that um, uh, the Donetsk Republic, the Lugansk Republic, and um, Kherson would like to join the Russian Federation, are considering having uh, a referendum to that to that point. Um, what we do not hear, but uh, you have to listen very closely to Russian television, to talk shows, uh, is to understand that within Russia, it is not um, a given fact that Russia will annex or uh, take over these territories. And there are reasons for that. Some of them are the same reasons that existed in 2014, when a similar appeal was made by Donetsk to Moscow. But, the, uh, but in Moscow, they did not want to aggravate the sanctions further and to risk uh, military escalation further. Moscow was not prepared for that in 2014. Today, uh, the military side, Russia is prepared, but on the economic side, the, the sanctions finally are, very, are, are potentially uh, very painful over a uh, period starting um, at the end of this year. That's to say, until then, um, the stocks will be fine and certain, um, certain um, import substitution will be fine. But full-scale import substitution may take five years to achieve, given that so, so many products, which are Russian and by all logic, have in them components which are not Russian. And uh, to replace all of those components takes a great deal of time and effort. So uh, it is... The, also the exclusion of Russian banks from the SWIFT system, these things are not to be taken lightly. And if there is a possibility of, of trading uh, certain claims, territorial claims, against an end to sanctions, I think that there are people within Russia uh, who are influential, who understand that it is a, an effort worth making. Now, what, do, what does this mean? Uh, that Russia, for example, would agree to the uh, these several republics, the Donbas republics and Kherson, um, becoming or stay remaining independent sovereign states, being protected internationally, and also, of course, by, by Russian military protection, which has been negotiated with the two, with the two uh, Donbas republics, um, and would be buffer states um, between Russia and a possibly still hostile a rump st uh, Ukrainian state that would be much smaller in military and economic potential than Ukraine was in February 2022. Um, the, the, so the benefit for Russia of establishing a cooling off period, whether that's five years, 10 years or 20 years, after which an internationally supervised referendum could take place, uh, that is worth considering. If in exchange, uh, Russia got its security concerns satisfied, namely no NATO, no Western um, uh, military presence, whether permanent or temporary in what is left of Ukraine, um, and uh, the universally recognized um, union of Crimea with Russian Federation and the universally recognized independent status of the three buffer states, which are friendly and, let's face it, dependent on Russia for their economic prosperity. This could be, from Russia's security standpoint, a very satisfactory end to the war, a victory, and at the same time, 
uh, it would be an argument, I think a very persuasive argument, for an immediate cessation to all of the sanctions. The, uh, the sanctions include, of course, the um, end of, of uh, uh, air transportation and other transportation between Russia and, and, and Europe, which is, at the level of people, a very painful price to pay. I was one of very few uh, foreigners of any kind in Petersburg. Uh, I got there because of a humanitarian visa, and my a family visa, my wife is Russian, but there are no businessmen, there are no Russians are not issuing any business visas, they're not issuing any tour, tour, tourist visas. And even if you, they were, how do you get there? Um, I got there, I say by, by, by the far side of the moon. <laughs> I traveled to, I flew to Tallinn and then took a bus to, to, um, to Petersburg. Well, that sounds simple, but it's not simple. Um, nobody had reckoned uh, that the border between Estonia and Russia is greatly delayed, water crossing is greatly delayed by between three and eight hours um, because there are Ukrainian refugees crossing from Russia into, into Estonia. That's something you don't read about in the New York Times. And why are they traveling that way? Well, this, the, there was a very big flood of these people after the, the complete um, capture of Mariupol and the opening of the humanitarian corridor. Uh, people are not stupid. They looked at the map and they understood that it was much safer to travel north through Russia to Scandinavia than to travel west through the area of hostilities in their own country. Hmm. And so a lot of uh, Ukrainians who may, who may not be uh, pro-Russian um, took the Russian route to it's get safer, to... It's safer for them to travel for Russia than the one for Ukraine. Absolutely. They were treated very well. Um, uh, the, when we went back from, uh, from uh, Petersburg to, to Estonia, we were delayed half an hour by three, because of three Ukrainian um, refugees. Well, they were very comfortable middle-class people who took their cat and their cat was admitted into Russia without any problem, but their cat was not admitted into Estonia without any problem. So uh, they were treated quite well in, in Russia and they had no complaints. But of course, their objective was to get to, to uh, Sweden where, they'll, where they will um, claim uh, refugee status. I don't know for how long, but that is their situation. There are others. All you need on a bus are several Ukrainians for your bus to be held up at hours at the border, and that's not very pleasant. Um, the, the alternative route is through Finland, which we will do when we go back to to, uh, to Russia in, in the middle of July. Uh, or you can fly from Istanbul, mm -hmm. only don't look at the map. I did and canceled my flight tickets because they're flying over Ukrainian territory. And it's amazing how short people's memory is about the MH17. It is, after all, an area of hostilities with, with, with rockets of all kinds flying in all directions. So it, it is not easy to get into Russia today. I'm hopeful that there will be an end to the war on a reasonable basis that allows for secession of, of the um, sanctions and restoration of at least minimal communications and other contacts between Russia and Europe. There is any prerequisites for peaceful negotiations to restart because there is no other effective mechanism to resolve the conflict except for sitting at negotiations table and to directly talk to each other. Well, in, uh, in political commentary in the States, some people are saying, well, this will end the way the Korean War ended uh, without a negotiated settlement, a de facto truce, and um, probably... Uh, um, the borders that are supervised um, and which prevent um, hostilities over the line of demarcation. That is one possibility. I think that, that um, Moscow has a different calculation. From the very beginning of the special military operation, they were hopeful that reasonable minds in the military, since military professionals generally are realists, and not ideologists, and they're not 
um, passionate people. They, Moscow was hoping that, that there'd be an overthrow of the, uh, of the Zelensky government and an ouster of the neo-Nazis around him um, uh, when they made their first move on Kiev. Well, that was too early and it was mistaken. However, this is no longer early. The, the Ukrainian army has be, is being badly destroyed. Uh, they are losing several, several hundred people, casualties a day, mostly killed and plus, plus uh, hospitalized. And uh, this cannot be sustained for more than a few weeks, but after which individual units in Ukraine will have more than 30% casualties and some will approach 50% casualties, which military professionals say is a point at which an army uh, doesn't exist anymore. Either the troops surrender and become prisoners of war, or they are killed, or they desert and, and flee for their lives. So this is the likely scenario several weeks from now that the, mil the professional military in, in Kiev uh, will possibly reach the conclusion that better to save something than to lose everything. And I think that this explains uh, something which has been bothered uh, Russians whom I spoke to, uh, who were concerned that perhaps their government was being too generous and too lenient with Kiev, why they have not bombed the Ministry of Defense or the presidential offices. I think that there is still a residual uh, hope or expectation in Moscow that the professional soldiers will do the job themselves, will remove Zelensky one way or another and all the people around him, and will sit down uh, at negotiations for a proper capitulation. So thank you very much for your expertise. It was a real pleasure to talk to you. My pleasure. Thank you.